everyone, come on in. Welcome to our uh, second session for this mo morning. Uh, we welcome you. We welcome you. We're giving everyone a chance to uh, make their entrance. Uh, we praise God. Uh, this session, session two, is set, uh, seminar 6B, Making the Shift to the New Normal. Uh, presenter will be Reverend Dr. James McCarroll. Okay, so we welcome you. We welcome you. Uh, we praise God for you. We hope you had a, a wonderful experience uh, with your first session this morning. So we praise God for you. And we say to you as you are coming in, uh, we say to you that uh, God is blessing us with this conference and we all all getting ready for a new thing. Isaiah 43 and 19, getting ready for a new thing, a new normal, amen, as a result of this uh, COVID-19 uh, pandemic and experience that is really uh changing our lives. So we say welcome. Welcome on behalf of our convention president, Reverend Dr. Carl L. Washington, Jr., and our Congress president, uh, Reverend James Banks II. Amen. We welcome you on behalf of them. And uh, we want to just say to you uh, that this is our 2020 uh, virtual church conference, and we just thank you for being participants in it. Um, Dr. Edward O. Williamson, uh, dean for the Congress, for those that may not know. Uh, my task today is uh, to uh, do uh, the introduction of our presenter, uh, to uh, let you know who our sponsor is for this conference, to offer prayer, and then to come back in at the end of this session with a question and answer feature. And so uh, let us just go through those housekeeping things uh, right now. Uh, so we, uh, again, we welcome you. Uh, we want you to know that we have a very prolific presenter for us this morning. Uh, he is Reverend Dr. James McCarroll, uh, pastor of the First Baptist Church in Murfreesboro, Tennessee. Uh, he is a friend. Uh, really, he's more like a son to me. We've been knowing each other since I've been in New York. Uh, so that's probably close to 20 years now that we've been knowing each other. Uh, and I met him as a seminary student, and uh, we were uh, challenged to adopt a seminary student, and, and I happened to choose this fine young man. And so, uh, so I want to introduce to some and present to others the Rank, Reverend James McCarroll. Uh, he's an outstanding young man, native of Tennessee, uh, just a prolific uh, speeder, speaker, prolific writer, author, uh, entrepreneur, uh, but the most of all, he's a lover of God and a pastor shepherd for his people. And so we want you to uh, prepare yourselves to listen to him as he presents to us today on the topic, making the shift to the new normal. At this time, I would like them to put up the slide for our, our sponsor. Amen. That we might know who our sponsor is for this week. Uh, Project Hope. Amen. Health, Outreach, Prevention, Education. And we want you to visit them at their website. Uh, where they are having an initiative uh, called All of Us, which is a, uh, a research project where they're trying to get 1 million participants, amen, to work on precision, precision health care. And so uh, visit their website, amen, that you may get more information, and we hope you're led to respond. They also want us to have uh, hope ambassadors in our local churches, and in our region. So, so support Project Hope and their initiatives. Thank you very much. <clears throat> Excuse me. Uh, at this time, we're going to uh, remind you that we will uh, entertain questions at the end of the presentation. And we ask you to use the Q&A feature uh, that's on your panel. Amen. And put your questions in. You can use chat and the Q&A throughout the session, but we will primarily focus on the question and ask period at the end. Uh, we give the uh, presenter, Dr. McCarroll, the latitude. So if he wants to engage, he can go off script, amen. And his presentation, as well as uh, this uh, video uh, recording will be in our on-demand ser service. So uh, Dr. McCarroll, it's in your hands. All right. Listen, good morning. I want to thank Dr. Edmund Williamson just for his leadership. He's just doing an amazing job as dean, uh, is just one of my mentors, but also just one of the guys I just I admire tremendously, does amazing work throughout this country, and you really have a gift 
in him. To Dr. Banks, uh, we thank God for him and just his leadership and his vision this year to, to go onto a totally different platform and do something that, that few guys dare to do, and that is shift the entire infrastructure uh, to be able to meet needs like your own. And so I'm excited about today's session. Listen, I'm going to go ahead and share the screen and want to invite you uh, into this conversation that we'll have entitled Making the Shift to the New Normal. And so I wanted to just shorten it to just say Making the Shift because what I found out is whenever you make a significant shift, a new normal uh, is, all, is pretty much a given. And so let's jump into it. We'll have a word of prayer and then we'll get started. Father, we thank you for this time together. Minister to each of us where we need it the most by your Holy Spirit. We pray that you would make it plain, make it relevant, make it applicable, that upon receiving uh, this information, Lord, we'll be able to see how you desire to use it in our various ministry contexts. And we thank you now in advance that you will give us insight and foresight to be able to understand how to handle that which is ahead of us so that you will continue to receive glory. The work of God will continue to move forward and the gospel of Jesus Christ will continue to be preached, presented, and lived. And so we thank you for what you're about to do in the name of Jesus. We ask it all, believe and get done. Amen. Listen, my name is James McCarroll. I pastor at the First Baptist Church in the beautiful city of Murfreesboro, Tennessee. I'm excited to share this session with you. It's a lot of information. I hope you have your pen and your pad ready. I'm going to give you as much as I can give you. Now, I will state at the outset, don't worry if you can't get everything written down. Uh, just let only write down that which the Holy Spirit begins to kind of speak to you as we go through the presentation. This entire PowerPoint will be given to the, the convention leadership or the Congress leadership, and they will have that readily available at the end of this session. So God bless you. Let's jump into it and get it started. So let's start here. Whenever there's a significant change in the global community, it has a ripple effect that impacts the church community. And so not only does it impact the church community, it impacts the church community at every level of its existence. So you couple that with our own regular challenges, and now the people in the pew have to require, have to find new ways or require new ways to engage Jesus so that they can be healthy at every level. And so whenever a major shift like a pandemic comes or a major shift like an economic downturn comes, or a major shift as in the George Floyd meets uh, Black Lives Matter movement. Anything that happens like that, as it impacts the people, it impacts the way we do church. Because now people are in a different space and we have to help them navigate their journeys and their fellowship with Christ by really considering where they are and then reconsidering where we are so that we can meet their need. And ultimately, if there's one word that speaks to that, it's the word shift meaning that we can't remain stagnant while the world around us is changing. I know this may be a little frustrating to some, it may be a little, a little jaw dropping to others, but fact is that we don't have to change. And so because that's the case, I wanna start with a scripture that really speaks to this well. You'll find the scripture in Luke chapter five, verses 36 through 39. It says, he spoke a parable to them saying, no one puts a piece from a new garment on an old one, otherwise the new makes a tear and also the piece that was taken out of the new does not match the old. And no one puts new wine, watch this, into old wine skins, or else the new wine will burst the wine skins and be spilled, and the wine skins will be ruined. But new wine must be put into new wine skins, and both are preserved, and no one having drunk old wine immediately desires the new, for he says the old is better. So I want to walk through this a little bit because this is the conversation we're really having. We, we have all of these new advancements that have taken place around us and, and new circumstances that have taken place around us. And we have to choose whether we're going to try to force them into a model that may be relatively outdated or incomparable to those developments or incompatible to those development, with those developments. Or are we going to choose to shift the model to be able to handle the new developments? And so many of us have such an affinity for that which was that we wrestle with whether or not we really want to become or whether or not we would just risk losing the wine. Uh, then after that, the Bible says that the one that's tasted old wine will always prefer the old wine to the new wine. And so it's not uncommon that those that have been in church for 30 or 40 or 50 years or, or even 10 years, 
may say, look, I kind of like what's going on now, but I really prefer what we've always done. Because when you get used to something, your, your, your culture and your habits are all locked up into it. And so because you're used to that, it's always challenging to handle what may have to become because you're used to what's been. To that end, I want to share a couple of things with you because I want to walk you through what's taking place now uh, and what usually happens that precedes a shift in church life. First thing is you have disorientation. Now, disorientation is when changes take place outside of the convenience and familiarity of a group, and they're thrust into a psycho-emotional place of anxiety. So in other words, this is when everything around a person changes. And what they're used to, they don't see. What they're common, what's common to them, what's familiar to them, doesn't seem to look the way it's always looked and they tend to get anxious. This is what you're seeing across the board with people saying, man, I'm used to waking up on Sunday mornings and now I get up on Sunday mornings, but I'm not dressing up or I'm used to having worship and equating worship with the sanctuary. And now I've got the worship, but there's no sanctuary and there's, a, there's an anxiety or maybe it's just wearing masks and it's saying, man, I hate going to, to the store having to put this thing on my face. And all of that frustration is a disorientation. It's, it's disorientation because we're used to a version of life and now life has changed. And we, and we wrestle with trying to want, with wanting to be where we were, but having to deal with where we are until the phase of reorientation. Now the phase of reorientation, this is when the changes remain in place and the individual begins to go through a process of adapting to life in a new space and adopting a set of core values, beliefs and habits that allow them to operate within their new context. So now they begin to realize, okay, this isn't changing. So I'm going to have to change. I'm going to have to change the way I think about eating. I'm going to have to change the way I think about worship. I'm going to have to change the way I think about fellowship with other people, change the way I think about family reunion. So all of these changes that are happening are the process of us reorienting to the environment that's around us. And then finally, after reorientation is orientation. This is the space of change where this, this is the space where change is no longer the change. Excuse me, this is the area or the time or the space where the change that has taken place is no longer a new space, but it becomes the normal space. And it becomes the foundation of existence. And those involved begin accepting it as the regular backdrop of their lives. So now what used to be weird becomes normal. What used to be kind of out of order and frustrating becomes our normal existence. So now I'm used to waking up and going to a tablet or a pad or a TV to, to have worship. Now I'm used to wearing a mask everywhere I go. And it's become part of the backdrop of our culture. And so when you talk about this, the worst thing that can happen in a season like this is that you a person choose to remain the same way they were before all of this stuff happened instead of adapting and adjusting to the changes that are taking place. Because what eventually happens is those that choose to not change end up becoming irrelevant in the community that had, or to the community that has adopted and adapted to the change. And so when that happens, the church normally has been notorious for this in past years. And currently one of the great challenges with the church is we're kind of caught between these two spaces where on one hand, we want to stay who we've always been. But on the other hand, we're seeing all of these changes in our society. And, and the blessing is that the church, unlike most organizations, has this ability to be elastic and flexible, meaning that we can change our mode of presentation and our methodology to adapt to the current space so that we can still preach the same gospel, even if we have to do it in a different way. And so I want to challenge us to really think about where the society is right now and think about how many changes have taken place and whether or not you, you're really willing to adapt to what's happening or, where, or whether or not you're stuck in being who you've always been and saying, we're going to just stay who we are and the world will come back to us. If that's going to be the case, or if it's gonna be the case that you're gonna to need to adapt, then I wanted to do this session because the adaptation process 
can happen normally at some level, but it's best to approach it strategically. So to approach it strategically, I wanted to have this conversation on making the shift. And so this workshop will provide just a simple practical outline for how to make the shift to what we're calling the new normal. Now, let me say this parenthetically that, that often, you know, when we talk about this, we only have these conversations when big things happen. But I would highly recommend that every 10 years as a congregation, you go through this process. Because the worst thing you can do is assume that the world around you and the changes that have been taking place within it have had zero effect on the congregation or the congregants uh, that are present in the, in the context of your worship experience or your church uh, congregational life. And so you wanna make sure that every 10 years you go through the same process just to make sure you stay relevant, make sure you're accurate in meeting your needs and to make sure that you're providing ministry that can uh, touch the people you're called to serve. So let's go a step further. So there are five phases to shifting. So when we talk about shifting, it doesn't all happen at once. Uh, to do it strategically means that you do it in, I would recommend five phases. So these phases are assessment, articulation, adjustment, advertising, and action. Assessment, articulation, adjustment, advertising, and action. So let's go into it and see kind of what each of these present to us. Let's start with assessment. So assessment, we, we have five questions. The first question is this, is there a need for a cultural or atmosphere refocus group to assess the current season, who needs to be on it and why. So the first thing you need to ask is, is it time for us to really build a team or a focus group, or in this case, a refocus group, to really look at where our culture is and our church atmosphere is as it pertains to engaging the culture that surrounds it. So, so people shouldn't walk into the church and feel like they're walking in through a time warp. So is it time for you to have that, that group built? And then who needs to be on it? I would highly recommend uh, several different generations of individuals to be on it. That way you hear voices from all of those uh, generations as well as people that have different socioeconomic spaces so that, or are in different socioeconomic spaces. So that way you hear those voices as well. You wanna, you wanna make the group as diverse as you can make it. And then you wanna make that group to, to be able to get all of those different angles uh, in the process of reformulation or formulation. Uh, and so with that being the case, when you do that, it gives you the sense of, of really understanding that, as I'm asked question why here, the real why behind it, or the, gives you the sense of uh, the, the need to be able to make sure that the word of God is being shared in a way that's easily translatable and relevant to the culture that's around it. The second question in, asses in assessment is, what is needed in this season? that wasn't present in the previous season. So you wanna ask this question because you wanna start thinking through things you need to have in place that may not have been in place before. So a lot of pastors have never been on Facebook, never been on Twitter, never been on Instagram. And so they realize, okay, when the church shifts, I'm gonna to need to be in a platform and in a space where I can still reach the people. And so they had to add things to their platform, things like Zoom, uh, things like Facebook Live. So you wanna ask what needs to be added in this season that we may not have had in the previous season. Number three, if the seasonal shift is temporary, which parts need to remain afterwards? Why and how should they look? So say for instance, you've added Zoom calls. And so now you do meetings on Zoom. Well, after the pandemic's over, do you need to throw that away or would this be something that, that could remain. Why should it remain? And in this case, you may say, well, with Zoom calls, people don't have to leave their homes. They save the gas expense. We don't have to worry about uh, expending the lights, uh, the, the electrical expense, and having the electrical expense at the church. Uh, we don't have to worry about parking lot safety. Uh, there are a number of different things. And then how should it look? So it may be that you do certain meetings on Zoom and you do other meetings face to face. So you wanna really think through after the pandemic, how much of this stuff really needs to remain. Then the next question, which is huge, is are the core values, vision and mission of the congregation still applicable? If so, how? And if not, which need to be removed and added? So the vision that you've set, the core values that you've set, do they still work 
in this environment. So if your one of your core values is we will kiss each other every time we we meet. Well, does that work now? You know what I mean? You have to really consider how your core values may need to shift. And then if some of the values don't work, then you may want to take them away. And then you may say, well, we need some other values that are in place. So maybe you add a justice component to, to kind of deal with this Black Lives Matter movement and some of the demands they have of the church. So, so you really start thinking through what values need to be adjusted, how the values need to be adjusted, and the vision and mission need to be adjusted. Number five, what does your SWOT analysis, so by SWOT, I'm speaking about strengths, weaknesses, opportunities, and threats. What does your SWOT analysis of the church say about how you are effective or ineffective in reaching the congregation, the community, and the world? So you want to really think through what are your strengths? What are your weaknesses? What opportunities do you have? And then which threats are present? And then when you consider those threats, you may say, okay, well, what do we need to address? Because this is really a clear and present danger or a clear and present threat in the life of our ministry. So you want to consider those things as well. So all of this is under assessment. This will take a little bit of time and it will take a whole lot of typing and, and, and note taking, but it will be very critical in making sure you have an accurate assessment of where you are. The second piece is articulation. So this is when we take it, take what we've assessed, we take all of these notes and we start to put it into common use language or, or clear language. So the first thing is, what are the revised core values of the church? What do the core values of the church need to be and what are they? Second thing is determine which areas the ministry will continue to focus upon and which are going to need to be added. So now you begin to say, okay, if these are our core values, you may have a list of ministries. Well, which ones need to stay? Which ones may need to be removed? Uh, which ones may need to be added? And so you want to think about the areas where the church now will be targeting its service. Then the third thing is you want to identify any budgetary adjustments that will need to be made to accommodate the new direction. So where does money need to go now? So now that you're getting these pieces in place, so how does the money picture need to look? Do we need to move money from one area to another? Or maybe we need to remove a budget line altogether or add a budget line. So you wanna really have that conversation as well. After that, you wanna identify any new personnel that will be needed to meet the newly identified needs. So this means if you say, okay, we're gonna need a web presence. We're gonna need a genuine bona fide web presence. Well. We may need a web supervisor or a web director or a web committee chairperson. Uh, so you want to really start thinking through uh, leadership and in some cases paid positions that may need to be present to facilitate the needs that the, the review and the assessment have now begun to, to uncover. So that, that way you have proper oversight in that area. Then the last thing is you want to host a meeting um, to discuss the new direction of the ministry. Now, I would primarily begin with key leaders, core leaders, uh, then massive leadership, and then the congregation. So you want to make sure you host this meeting to discuss this direction, but you also want to give people space for feedback. Because just because you have a focus group, it doesn't mean that they have all of the answers or all of the angles. So you want to make sure that you open up that space so any individuals in that meeting can chime in and give sound feedback. And then you want to make sure you adopt adopt it as best possible. Everything you won't be able to do, but there are some things you will be able to do that will effectively uh, provide some, some, some good stuff for the, the growth and the development that you're going, undergoing as a result of shifting. The third area, big area, is adjustment. So you want to identify the desired results, actions, beliefs, and experiences. Then you want to identify the current results actions, beliefs, and experiences, and I'll explain that in a moment, and the term, then determine what needs to be adjusted in each area. So when we talk about results, actions, beliefs, and experiences, this language is borrowed from the book, Change the Culture, Change the Game. Uh, in that book, they talk about how to actually shift the culture. And so uh, it's probably one of the best books on culture shifting I've read, but the results point to the actual final outcomes. Actions point to the behaviors that produce those outcomes. Beliefs point to the heart beliefs or uh, the heart truths that cause the actions that end up in the results. And then experiences uh, 
point to the actual face-to-face -face encounters or the real-time encounters that create beliefs or make space for or introduce beliefs that end up in actions that produce results. And so what this looks like in real time is you want to start with results. What are the results you desire to see? So let's say your desired result is that people become selfless servants. Well, if they're going to become selfless servants, the results would be that the people actually serve others before they serve themselves. So it's perceived that they're selfless. The actions to go into that is they have to make a decision to put others before themselves and then act on that decision. The belief then must be that other people are more valuable in the moment for service than me serving myself or the I value serving others before serving myself. That may be the core of the heart belief. And then the experiences that will produce that is when they're in spaces where they see that happening. So in many churches, what happens is we get certain results because we give people certain experiences. So for instance, in our church, hospitality is big for us. We believe in five-star hospitality. So what that means is when a, on a rainy day, we have people in the parking lot with umbrellas from the time a person steps out of their car, this is the experience. They walk, all, they walk all the way into the church. Once they get there, they're given a bag for their umbrella. They're given a washcloth to wipe their arms off. And then they're escorted into the sanctuary. Well, with that experience, the belief that would come from that is that other people's needs supersede their, my own. Well, then when they go into the sanctuary, now they understand this is a belief of the house. So they began to do that for others. And the result is people's needs are being met by others even more than they're being met by themselves. And so you begin to see that. So you want to identify those areas, the desired areas, and you want to walk through each of them. And then you want to identify the current stuff. What are our current results? What are our current actions? What are our current beliefs? Then what are our current experiences? So for instance, if we currently have dirty bathrooms, usually it's because when people walk in, the bathrooms are already dirty. So they believe dirty bathrooms are okay here. So they contribute to the dirtiness, that's their action. And then the result is you have a dirty bathroom. So you wanna look at what your current state is, and then you wanna determine what needs to be adjusted in each area. So what needs to be adjusted as it pertains to results, actions, beliefs, and experiences. Now, with this being the case, you won't be able to do it all at once because as you're talking about a new normal, most of us are in the middle of a budget year. Uh, and so because we're in the middle of, a fit, middle of a fiscal year, you have to identify which areas can actually be budgeted immediately and which may need to be budgeted at a later time or maybe in the next uh, calendar year. So you want to make sure you're making that adjustment as well. So as you see all of these changes that need to take place, then you begin the, the budget accordingly. And finally, you want to share the updates with the congregation and the leadership and build an accountability campaign around them. This means that once you tell everyone, hey, here's the direction we're going, now you can begin to hold people accountable to it. Now you can begin to, to, to hold their feet to the fire, if you will. So if they're doing something that's out of line with the belief system and, and you know will produce actions and results that aren't in alignment with where the church is heading, then you can actually say, hey, man, you know, here's the belief we, we agreed upon. And, you know, let's hold, let's keep it in the road on this. So you want, you can do that and it allows there to be a, a, an accountability, not only amongst your leadership, but eventually amongst the congregation as a whole. So once you get all of that in place, then you want to go to advertising. So you want to make this new vision or this new normal, if you will, you want to break it down into a state, a single statement or a list of principles. Now these principles are equal to your core values. So you want to make sure you have that broken down into a space where you can clearly see it. Then you want to think through ways to post them extensively throughout the ministry. So now, in this case in time, but we're not in the building, you may do it on every flyer or have it on every broadcast or have it said in every space so that that way people are constantly hearing uh, these new values. The third thing is you want to create a short version of the mission statement that speaks to the church's mission. So you may have a long mission statement, but you want to create a soundbite version that people can hear, adopt, uh, and recite that keeps the mission on their lips and in their hearts uh, on a regular basis. So for instance, our mission, the short version is um, we're welcoming people committed to discipleship and impacting the world for Jesus Christ. They hear it every Sunday. They hear it all over the place, but they're able to hear it 
adopted and recited regularly without over time, without us even having to guide them in doing that. So you want to make sure that mission and that normal is in a soundbite system or soundbite uh, phrase or set of phrases that people can speak and they can kind of hold on to the new culture that's there. Number four, you want the leaders to mention the new beliefs as they support as a supporting reason for decision making. So what you want to do is as they make decisions, you want to go back to those core beliefs, not the values, but the beliefs. And so what that does is it kind of cements the beliefs into the hearts of the people and it cements the beliefs into the hearts of the leadership. And so as they're doing that, uh, they're remembering those beliefs and then acting accordingly. Then the last thing is the brand new belief system. You want to brand the new belief system, excuse me, by putting it on apparel or office and promotional items so it unifies the body. So what this means is when you get all of this stuff in place, you want to put it on a t-shirt or maybe you put it on mugs or you put it on pens or you put it on notepads. So that way they can always have it in front of them and the people that are all wearing the same t-shirt kind of see the message being central to the gathering instead of their individual agendas. And so that helps to unify the group uh, as a part of this process. Then the last, last five things, super easy. Last one is action. So you want to, number one, set a launch date. So you want to have a set date where it's going to start. So it's not, hey, we're going to start randomly. Everyone's aware that this date is coming. Then you want to set a review date. So this date uh, will be the date, so, so say it's every quarter or every two months or every six months, where you go back into uh, this space as a group, as a core group, and you begin to talk through how the new vision's coming, how the new normal is progressing. If there are areas where you need to make adjustments or if there are areas that aren't quite catching on. And so you wanna make sure you have those review dates set. And then it's green light, baby. That's when you get on it, you, you get it started, you kick it off, you could do it in a huge event or you could just do it at the top of the fiscal year, but you kick it off and you put everything in place and you start moving forward. The fourth thing is you wanna time release other advertisements. So what this means is you don't want to do all of it at once. You may say, okay, we'll, we'll roll the pens out three months out, or we'll roll out notepads six months out, or we'll roll out t-shirts eight months out. And that way you're constantly revisiting that vision in a way that's tangible and the people can kind of reconnect to it. The last thing is the biggie. You have to choose to refuse to go back to what you did before the shift. So part of this entire process is to make sure you make a sound decision to say, look, we are in a new space and this is the way we'll move from this point forward. That concludes the, the presentation. Uh, I wanted to take this time for Q&A and give a little more time for Q&A in this session uh, than we had in the last session. So are there any questions? And good afternoon, feel free at this time. If you are on the phone, you can raise your hand for questions. And we can allow you an opportunity to ask your question briefly to Dr. McCarroll. If you are also um, on your computers and you would like to ask the questions, we will go ahead and spotlight you for that question as well. We do have a question in the um, Q&A field. Okay. So what is the name of the book you referenced? It's called mm -hmm. Change, Change the Culture, Change the Game. Oh, let me go back to all five. Let me do it here. Let me pull it back up. So sorry. So it's called Change the Culture, Change the Game. That's the name of the, of the book. And Dr. McCarroll, why you have, thank you so much for pivoting back um, to five, um, to all five, um, so that the, uh, Ms. Navanda can screenshot. We will also let you know that the presentation will be made available via on demand um, so that you will receive that presentation. Um, you can also go back and view this entire presentation on demand. You will receive a link from the Empire State. Uh, Baptist Tech Team, and they will forward that link to you.
Okay, so I see a couple of other questions. The author of the book, I've got to pull it up. I cannot remember his name. Uh, just to be honest with you, I can see the the, the cover of it, uh, but I cannot remember the name at the moment. But I'll, I'll make sure I get it to to um, Dean Williamson. So, do I believe the new normal will cause a church split? Now, I think what we're going to see um, in this new space is it it could potentially cause it cause church splits. But I think one of the great challenges that we're going to run into is if churches are willing to do it, but don't have the resources to do it, it's necessary that they are willing to articulate that versus just not doing, not doing it um, or just, or just not shifting. Uh, that way people can understand that, Hey, they have a heart to do it, but we may need to give so they can actually bring it to pass. Um, when it comes to most church splits, uh, most church splits split, uh, they usually happen for one of three reasons. One is ego, uh, usually ego, uh, meaning that a person feels like they've outgrown the ministry and that they're, they're, they have a loyal little following, so they go and want to do their own thing, have their own kingdom, if you will. The second is... Um, the inability of, of, of a person feels like they're not being properly spiritually nourished in an environment. Uh, and so they choose to start an environment uh, that will meet their needs. Yeah, Roger Connors and Tom Smith, thank you. Um, and then the third cause of the church split that we see is what we're talking about now, where people say, look, we're not changing. We're going to be who we are. Uh, and this is who we are. And, and the the um, aesthetics, if you will, and the habits and the rituals are equated uh, to being just as valuable as Christ himself. And so they, they see worship, they can't detach uh, Christ from their religious concepts of how to engage and encounter Christ. And so they feel like to make any changes would be borderline uh, idolatrous and sacrilegious. And so because that's the case, uh, they choose to stay where they are. And so that's kind of what I see. But I think if churches are honest again and say, look, we just don't have the resources. Uh, we want to do it. We have a heart to do it, but we don't have the resources yet. This is what our plan is for making these adjustments. I think most people will not leave. They'll, they'll, they'll either give more or they'll, they'll provide support because they see you've done the work uh, to prepare yourself for the shift. Um, I see another one. How do you keep members engaged until this process is complete? Let me say this. I, I don't know if I mentioned it. It takes 18 months for any church culture to shift, for any culture to shift, church or otherwise. It takes 18 months. Let me say it again. It takes 18 months for any culture to shift. And so what you want to do is, is you have to, again, but they have to see where you're going. If you put the vision out there, and they see where you're heading, and they see you're actively making progressive steps in that direction, people are willing to go along and help with spaces that are growing in that way. If people say, look, you know, you need to do it now, and we, if they don't hear anything, or they assume you don't care, or it's not a valuable thing to you, that's when they begin to leave. But as long as they see the shift is taking place, even as long as it's steady and it's targeted, People are willing to work along with that. Um, and now, now there are some people that don't want to shift and you have to be patient with them, just like God is patient with you. Uh, and when God says, look, I need you to stop cussing and, and you take 40 years to stop cussing, then God is patient with you. He doesn't say, look, I'm just taking your breath because you don't know how to, how to handle your mouth. No, he, he, he gives you that time. And so we have to just be patient, but we have to always keep the vision in front of them and that will keep them uh, usually engaged and working with the core team to make sure the vision comes to pass. Okay, so how long did it take for your church to shift and what group of people, what major hindrances? Now, you're not going to get me in trouble on this broadcast trying to get me to tell everything, but I will say this. So it took 18 months. Uh, 18 months is a sound number. There's a good book called Managing One's Self by Peter Drucker, a uh, very good little short book, and he talks about that. Uh, but it took 18 months. There was no way around it. Uh, there were some people that caught it early, on the first month. Then there were some people that caught it in the 12th month. Some people caught it in the 14th month. Uh, but ultimately, most everyone could handle the new culture in an 18-month window. And so 
if that's the case, um, what you want to do is, and so with that group, the people that were probably the hardest to get on board were seniors. Uh, and, and it was fitting. It was understandable because most seniors, uh, are, you kind of create a routine after a certain point just for security. You know what needs to happen. You have a certain routine for your money, for your time, for your days. And so when you make a huge shift like that, it takes time to adapt and adopt, to adopt, uh, to adopt it and adapt to it. So uh, some of them were some of the harder ones. Uh, but after about 16 months, most of them came on board. Uh, you have a couple others, uh, but there always be, there will always be a couple others. So they came on board and for the most part, they're doing, they're, they're on board with it. So 18 months, keep that number in front of you, 18 months. It takes 62 days to create a habit, but 18 months to shift the culture. Uh, if you're currently without a pastor, is this something that the leadership can take on by themselves? Absolutely, absolutely. Um, you want to have your core leaders. Uh, in this case, if there is no pastor, you may want to identify a person that will be um, kind of an overseer of the process. And it could be just the lay leader, whoever's a strong, you want to make sure they have a strong gift of administration uh, because they're going to have to deal with a lot of different ministries. They're going to have to deal with a lot of different attitudes and they're going to have to kind of keep people together. So you want them to have really the gift of leadership and the gift of administration, uh, as well as you want to make sure they have a calm, loving, uh, and encouraging demeanor. Because as you talk about bringing new things on board, people respond in different emotional ways. Uh, and so you want to make sure they have a demeanor that's not easily shaken uh, and that is loving uh, and able to be received by most people. So I would highly recommend you begin the process. Now, you may say, well, what about what if our pastor comes on board and he doesn't like what we're doing. Well, remember, it's Baptist church. So you get to, you get to identify the pastor. When you see where God is calling you to go, uh, you can also have that conversation with them on the front end because I don't believe that you know God would just randomly throw a pastor at you. If, if there's a space where you have an opportunity to have dialogue and share that this is kind of what you see God doing. And as you begin to see the church grow as well uh, through the ministry work shift, then he can kind of speak to that. And, and you pray that God will send the person that has his heart for the work uh, that he's shown you all to do. And so you want to make sure you do that. But I would recommend go ahead and get started, at least start doing the assessment pieces. And that way you'll have some hard data uh, and some good conversational pieces and some, some good insight on where you need to go. Monica and Barbara, how do you help members to accept the new normal and change? Um, two ways, two ways. Uh, number one is you have to approach them with the heart of love and you have to approach them with with a genuine desire to see them not adopt your agenda but to see them uh become who god has called them to be so that the agenda moves forward you have to genuinely love them genuinely want them to be in a space where they become an asset to the move of god not just you don't want to hear them fuss in meetings you want to hear them. you want to see them be used by God in mighty ways. The second thing is this, you want to give them two things. You want to give them value and you want to give them a voice. Uh, there's a great book on leadership called um, The Performance Factor by Pat McMillan, very good book. Uh, and it talks about when you have all these people that are going different directions, you give them a voice. You let them know that their voice is valuable. You're not just dumping a bunch of principles on them, but you give them voice and you let you hear their feedback on it. And then you dialogue with them about if this is the outcome, what are the, what are the best ways to actually bring this outcome to pass? And so once they have a chance to have that conversation, usually when they're heard and their values matter, then they become stakeholders in it and where their, where their hearts go, their feet usually follow. And so that's the way I would recommend it, uh, that you approach them. Number one is out of love. And then number two is by giving them value uh, and by giving them a voice. The next one, uh, what happens when resources equates to people, not money? Um, you're going to need both. Uh, you're going to need both. Uh, but, but I think one thing Jesus shows us by only choosing 12 disciples and not 1,200 is that you can change a world with 12 people if you have a good vision for them. And if you, if you highlight, if you know their gifts and you identify the gifts and you base the ministry work on their gifts, and you base how they operate in their lanes on their gifts, then you'll get a lot more done and you'll see, you'll see the ministry produce well. Uh, I'll give you a case in points. So when I started at our church, it's about 200 people, maybe 215 people. Uh, and they were all mostly, well, they were mostly older. They were, 
they were easily 60 and above, 55 and above. And so I started with a group of seniors. We had maybe 12 or 15 children in the church total. Uh, and they were just coming because their fa their parents were parts of very large families that were already in the church and been, had been in the church for years. And so what we did was we didn't try to throw this big vision at them and tell them to do all of this stuff. We sat down with them and said, what do you guys have? And I noticed that everyone in the church um, was had the gift of fellowship and they loved to eat, loved to cook. And so what dawned on me was they're great at fellowship. They love hanging out, love talking, staying all night long. So we built on those strengths. And then we had other strengths that were there and we built on what we had until we got what we needed. And so when you have the people, the thing most people do is they, they limit the roles and then try to force people into roles for which they're not gifted uh, and they're not called. Instead of doing that, allow the people's giftings to determine the roles. And that way you build the ministries based on the gifting or you build the assignments based on the gifting instead of forcing a person into an assignment that doesn't match their gift and you'll all of a sudden see a level of productivity you've never imagined. And then you train them in leadership. So now they begin to mimic or they begin to duplicate themselves or in some cases replicate themselves as far as leadership and diligence goals in the lives of other people. And you have your first wave of movement as a church in the new direction. Um, how to help your leaders communicate the same message to your members and not put a spin on it in your personal view. Uh, what we did, one thing we did that was really good, and I, and I can recommend it to you, is we created these uh, folded business cards. Uh, and so inside of the folded business card on the front, it said core values. And on the inside, it had the core values on one side and the core principles on the other. And we gave them out to everybody. So everyone at church had the same card with the same language. And so when they come into a meeting, if there was a leader in the meeting that had their own agenda or their own language, the card spoke for itself. And then there were so many people that had the card, they could do the comparative analysis and realize that what they're saying is not in, li in alignment with what we're actually doing. So that's one way to do it. The other thing is, when you when you see it happening, you do call it to the carpet. That's hard because sometimes they're your friends and y'all eat chicken salad together and y'all go hang out at, at, at different places together. But you have to make sure that the, the mission of God supersedes even the personal agendas and even personal fellowships. Because the worst thing you can do is sabotage the move of God uh, for the sake of nepotism uh, or for the sake of maintaining a personal relationship that will cost the church. Uh, life-giving relationships in con in the congregational life. And so I would highly recommend, highly, highly, highly recommend uh, that you create some cards that everyone can see, and then you put it up all over the building so people can't really, you know, skew it. And then you put it on some places, social media-wise or website-wise, where it explains it thoroughly, and people can go on there and get the explanation. And then on those cards, you can actually refer them to that space where they can hear the explanation in its totality. Any other questions? I'm actually here listening and and you're doing a great job, uh, Dr. McCarroll, uh, fielding the questions. Uh, uh, we know you have a brilliant mind. Uh, again, we ask those that have questions if you would put try to use the Q and A feature. Uh, but if you don't know how to use the Q&A feature, put it in the chat and we'll try to catch it. And there may be some other area where you want to get some information. We'd love to uh, address those. So we have a couple more questions. Uh, uh, can we do the same with the new normal direction? Um, Um, may have to ask it a different, oh, yeah, 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 absolutely. So with the new normal direction, that's what we're talking about. You want to create a business card concept um, that will have those principles on it. So that's the goal is, is when you have that new normal, you want to put it in front of the people's faces as much as possible. Uh, so, because remember, they've got a shift. And so you want to keep that in front of them, just like 
everywhere you go now, you see a sign that says, please wear a mask, please wear a mask. You know, people don't do it. But what it does do is by people seeing that so much, it, it kind of jogs their memory and puts them in a place where they, they continue the habit. Uh, what's a good budget? Uh, that's, that's a loaded question. Uh, but depending, so the budget you have uh, is the budget you have. Let me start there. The biggest thing with budget is not the bottom line number, it's what you do with what you have. Uh, and so you wanna make sure that when it comes to the percentages of the budget, you wanna consider, uh, I would recommend several different areas. Uh, one is going to be overhead costs. And so these are building expenses. This is you know, keeping the lawn cut if you, if you don't have a person that volunteers to do it. This is electric bill, water bill, light bill, security bill, all of those things. After that, you want to have your administrative expenses. So these are, uh, and this is usually going to run between the two of these. I, we usually lump these together. You're talking about probably 30% of your budget is there. Um, when it comes to the other 70%, that's where you want to look at your core values and you want to consider kind of how you're using those funds to reflect uh, and carry out the core values of the church and the details that go along with that. And that usually is a good solid budget number. Uh, now, what I also recommend if you want to is you could do that for 60% and then take 10% and put it up for a rainy day. And so as a church, as you wanna make sure you do have an investment strategy because life happens uh, as members age or if there were a tragedy that happened and the pastor leave and that charismatic guy's gone all of a sudden, then now you have funds to over to, to provide um, support just in case the numbers tend to drop. And so that rainy day fund is huge. I recommend that you find a bank. Uh, if you want to go a bank route, you find a bank with a money market account that will give you an unlimited uh, give you unlimited coverage because most usually go to two hundred fifty thousand for FDIC purposes. There are some though that will let you put it into a money market account and give greater coverage and greater return on investment. And you wanna also have a relationship with an investor uh, uh, or investment broker uh, that can help kind of walk you through healthy strategies for investment as a church. Just like you want your money to work for you, also you wanna make sure some of the church's money is working for it as well. Um, can I talk a little about your book, Black Millennials in the Church? That actually is not my book. Uh, that's Dr. Mitchell's book, uh, but I can't talk about it. Uh, Black Millennials in the Church, it's a phenomenal book uh, that came out of his doctor, doctoral research. Uh, that research was uh, where they just kind of surveyed millennials throughout the country and really asked them some really hard questions, some hard questions about church life as it is and church life kind of as it as they would like to see it. And so they discuss a number of different areas in that book uh, that really speak to church life and give us some good insight on Black millennials. Now, there, if you're looking at uh, a great concept, more comprehensive concept on millennials, you can get, I would also recommend with that book, getting the book, The Millennials by Tom Rainer and, and Jess Rainer. Uh, those two books together will give you a wonderful insight uh, on millennials. And if you want to add a third one to the, to the, to the, uh, to the, to the group, I recommend, uh, uh, the name is slipping me. It's by Gary McIntosh, uh, One Church, Four Generations. And so I would, act, I would act, recommend adding that book to it as well. Uh, and that book gives you not only the millennials, but it gives you uh, baby boomers, it gives you Generation X, it gives you all of those, and you get to see how they all kind of play together. Uh, I would highly also recommend that you take one session of Bible study and really talk through it generationally. Do a, do a study on all of this and read these books, but then have a Bible study and talk about what the needs of each generation are. I'll never forget, we did it a couple of years back, maybe a year ago, and it was just amazing to hear what baby boomers needed versus what millennials needed. And so the baby boomers that were teaching Sunday school could kind of hear where they could up their game as it pertained to millennials. And the millennials could hear where they needed to up their game as pertained to engaging um, engaging baby boomers. And then the groups in between, all, everyone gets that chance to have that dialogue. I think we need to be very cognizant of one another's strengths, one another's desires, one another's uh, appetites, if you will, 
Uh, and as we do that, then the church doesn't become lopsided to one group or the other, but it becomes kind of a, a, a symphony, if you will, of giftings and skills and, and, and opportunities. So everyone feels like they have a place and that they're being heard. Uh, where are your young people in the shift and what are you doing for them? Where are they in, where are they in on planning on the shift? So we shifted a while back. We actually shifted 2016. We started our 10 year plan. And so we already were in a process of, of shifting everything, technology, um, shifting our focus to hospitality, discipleship, worship, and outreach, but doing it in a very intentional way. Uh, so we're really now in year, year four of the shift. So we did it late 2016 and started in 2017. So we're in year four of our shift. And this is the phase where we're talking about redefining family. And so we literally, instead, before we just jumped in the small groups and all of that, we went back to the core, to the family. And I think that no one can minister to the hearts of young people like their families. And so we don't want to make sure, we don't want to become surrogates uh, in the raising of people. We want to become assistants in the raising of their children. Uh, and so uh, as we do, as we do this for our young people, one thing we, we were big on was making sure we identified some needs. We brought their parents into a room, brought them into a room and heard their needs as it pertains to creating a youth concept, a youth and children's concept for them. And so we literally just hired the youth and children's pastor right before we went into the pandemic. So that the model's in place, but now we're making a couple of adjustments even on that. Uh, and we're seeing seeing some pretty good responses to that. But we, we're in the very early phase of that. So uh, it'll be another 18 months uh, before we really see that pick up. Uh, author of Black Millennials uh, is Joshua Mitchell. Is that right, Dr. Williamson? Yes, that's right. Dr. Joshua Mitchell. Mitchell, he was on the call last night. Yes. And he was one of our presenters yesterday. Uh, we are, we are, uh, it's, it's never enough time when we're doing these types of things, never enough times. And uh, you, you have such a smooth way of uh, speaking about things. Uh, so we, uh, if you have one or two more questions, I think we can squeeze them in. Okay. If, if anybody has one or two more questions, you can squeeze, try and squeeze those in. Um, these, are great, time. these are really great questions. So I really appreciate you guys asking. Okay. All right. Uh, well, first of all, we want to say thank you, Dr. McCarroll, my friend, my brother. Awesome. Uh, <laughs> uh, we know, you know we have a special friendship, and I, you have really blessed us. Uh, you know we discussed this, and we talked about not just we're going to have a, a, a new situation, but it's a change. And many times we try to change without anticipating the transitions Mm -hmm. that are necessary. And I think you uh, really highlighted the transitions, uh, not just saying we're doing something new, but helping people uh, to process uh, the shift. And so thank you uh, very much for that. Uh, uh, we are getting ready to close out. Do you have any concluding remarks that you'd like to share? Let me say this. God would have never allowed you or me or any of us to be in this space if he had not equipped us knowingly or unknowingly for this season. So we're here, but we're here with a God that is not changing and a God that knew it was coming. So I encourage you to take this time uh, after this, these sessions and pray, hear from the Lord, let him guide your, your thoughts, let him guide uh, your movements. Uh, and what you'll end up seeing is that everything you needed, number one, was in the house, number two was in your heart, and number three is in, will be in your hands. So I encourage you just to let God guide you in this season as you make the shift. I know it's scary. I know sometimes it can come with a lot of trepidation, but I really encourage you to find peace in knowing that he's Jehovah Jireh, which means the God that foresees. And then he gives us, he provides his provision based upon his vision to make sure that we're exactly where we need to be with what we need to have. God bless you. All right. All right, sir, thank you very much. Let us uh, prepare ourselves to close with prayer. Again, we ask you to visit the uh, websites for our sponsor, uh, Project Hope, uh, Health Outreach Prevention Education. And uh, we need to have uh, health ministries in our church, health and wellness ministries in our churches uh, to have ambassadors for us 
uh, in our churches uh, promoting those areas. We also say to those of you that are joining us, uh, this is our last seminar for today, but tonight uh, this is uh, uh, done under the uh, auxiliary of the Congress of Christian Education of the Empire Missionary Baptist State Convention of New York. And so our president of the Congress will give his address tonight. And so we actually, if you could join us, uh, go to Empire's webpage, amen. And uh, we will be do using Facebook Live at the Empire Baptist Convention uh, Facebook page. And uh, join us tonight, support our president at seven o'clock tonight. Again, uh, we also say that we will have all the presentations from this conference, uh, the video recordings of the sessions, and the uh, presenters' uh, outlines available in our on-demand page. Uh, you will receive a link to that uh, shortly. Uh, we're hoping to have it up uh, no later than Friday of this week where you can go back and review all the material. So uh, we thank you again. That is about, uh, we thank our te technology uh, team, amen, the Bethel technology team uh, that was assisting us today Minister Letitia Robinson and Brother Jamal Mosley. Thank you all, did an excellent job. And uh, again, Dr. McCarroll, you did an excellent job. And all of you uh, joining with us, we had over 40 participants in this session. Thank you all for joining with us. Now let us close out with prayer. Let's bow our heads together. Dear God, we just thank you for your grace, your mercy, and your loving kindness, Lord God. We thank you for Dr. McCarroll, who has poured out and blessed us this morning, Lord God. Now, Lord God, we ask you to pour back into him. Bless him, Lord God, uh, for his faithfulness, for his uh, willingness to feed and lead your people, Lord God. Strengthen him and strengthen his congregation and help them to, to keep on ministering uh, in the context where you have planted them, Lord God. And Lord, bless all who have joined this seminar today. We give you all glory, honor, and praise in Jesus' name. Amen, amen, amen. amen. God bless all of you. Have a wonderful day. Thank you for being with us uh, in this, our 2020 virtual church conference. God bless you. Dr. McCarroll, thank you. Oh, you're welcome, man. You're welcome. All right. I need, I need to holler at you, man. I'll give you a call when we go off. All right.